So let me introduce the speakers today. Um, first up, we'll have Ben Bolton, who's working with Cotswold Fair with on a placement with On Purpose. Um, he's the second placement we've had in the last year. On Purpose, thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it if you want someone impacting a business in the sustainability area. Um, they run a, a, a one new cohort every six months and um, you can have a placement of someone who's good at what they do and is also receiving mentoring and training at the same time. Uh, second up, we have Svanika Balusabramanian. Just about got that right, I think. Um, Svanika is from Repurpose, which is uh, an organization which uh, helps companies offset their plastic. And Svanika is actually a Forbes 30 under 30 honoree, which is, I know, is very, very difficult to uh, achieve that accolade. So we're welcoming Svanika today with her expertise in the area of plastic. And finally, we've got Andrew Walker from T Rex which isn't a dinosaur, um, it's a brand of tea, although there are dinosaurs involved, I believe. So Andrew has, uh, is going to talk to us about his journey into removing plastic from his product. So I'm Paul Hargreaves, if you don't know me, I'm the CEO of Cotswold Fair. And uh, Ben, if you want to get the first um, slides going, that would be great. So Plastic was only invented actually 150 years ago and, and in very little usage for the, the first few decades of that. Um, but now, unfortunately, plastic is absolutely everywhere. If you click through, Ben. And anywhere you go now, there is plastic. It's on the highest mountain, it's in the deepest ocean. It's even embedded in Antarctic and Arctic ice. This um, is a picture I took when I was walking along a river in India for eight days um, with, with no mobile phone. And the, if, if anywhere there's uh, an obvious statement of how bad plastic is, this is just a, a picture, incredibly picturesque part of the world. Yet that shore of the beach is littered with plastic. The average meal we eat contains 100 bits of microplastic, by the way. Enjoy your lunch, by the way, after this uh, seminar. And the average plastic bag is only used for 12 minutes. 50% of all plastic manufactured has been made in the last 15 years. And whilst plastic is a, is a more easy thing for people to get their heads around, and that was evidenced by Blue Planet in 2019, it is an equally bad problem as carbon, but it's one and that is intrinsically linked with carbon as well. So the largest producer of plastic in the UK is Ineos in Scotland. And obviously plastic's made from fossil fuels anyway, but they, in the making of all the plastic they make, they also emitted 1.6 million tonnes of CO2 last year. We've just, clicking through to the next slide, uh, opened a, a shop called Flourish in Bristol area and we wanted that shop to be completely plastic free. It isn't and the reason it isn't is because our suppliers haven't done enough at reducing and eliminating their plastic. We still aim for that shop to be completely, completely plastic free. We still aim for the whole of the Cotswold Fair range to be completely plastic free. We've launched an unpackaged solution which where people bring their own containers and fill up and that is it on site in Flourish and it's also on site in 10 other stores that we've put in over the last 10 years. But as an industry, we're not moving far enough. We're not moving fast enough. And obviously today is all about helping us all to move faster and move further into eliminating the evil that is plastic in the food and drink sector. So I'm handing over to Ben now, who will carry on on the same vein. Thanks, Ben. 
Thank you, Paul, and thanks everyone for joining today, and um, particularly all those that participated in uh, the recent uh, call for plastic data. Uh, we really appreciate your help, and we're going to be sharing some of the outcomes from that work today, which we're really excited to announce. But before we get on to that, I'm going to cover the problem with plastic, how we can solve it, and some of the key actions businesses can take. So um, I'm actually going to skip this because we're very short on time. But this, this is a great, um, this is a great documentary that I recommend you watch called the the, um, the story of plastic that also covers this in, in greater detail. So what's the problem with, with plastic? Well, in, in just a few slides, um, our plastic production is currently skyrocketing. So uh, in 2015, which is the latest year that we have kind of accurate records for, um, we produced 381 million tons of plastic which the UN uh, Environment Programme estimates is roughly equivalent to the weight of the entire human population, which I just think is a really staggering fact. Um, and this is the kind of chart that I think we often overlook um, when we're talking about you know, recycling, we'll get onto that, is just the fact that we, we keep on producing so much plastic and you know, at the moment there's no kind of reduction in, in, in sight of this top line figure. And the reason why this is such a problem is um, you know, partially because we, you know, most of this ends up in, in the natural environment. So you can see here, the vast majority of plastic produced has, is discarded. And although our recycling rates are improving, there's still a huge, um, you know, huge gap. And so a lot of it ends up either incinerated or in the natural environment. And obviously it leads to a whole load of issues, as Paul was mentioning earlier. And actually, even what we recycle a very small proportion of that is is kind of effectively recycled so a lot you know the vast majority of that is effectively downcycled so it becomes uh, a kind of lesser valuable thing um and, and that's kind of a huge part of the problem here is that for the most part downcycling is just delaying plastics kind of journey to become landfill or, or waste uh, or incinerated for that matter with all the kind of problems associated with with those outcomes um, and a very small amount is kind of closed loop and really kind of used for a similar quality application. So it's really simple, you know, the more plastic we create, the more plastic waste uh, we create. And you can see from this data on the right, there's kind of a direct correlation between the two. And packaging plays a huge role in that. And you can see it's kind of the biggest proportion here. Um, so I think, you know, we have a huge uh, kind of role to play in uh, kind of tackling this issue. So. Um, yeah, as I say, plastic packaging is kind of the main source you can see here. Um, and also it's worth uh, kind of considering the role of the UK. So the UK generates more plastic waste per person than any country except the US. Um, so Greenpeace recently ran this campaign, the, the kind of middle bottom image here that shows the actual amount of plastic waste that we, we kind of dump in other countries. Um, this is in the context of Downing Street. So it was kind of a kind of political campaign that they ran. Um, but we actually export about 80% of the recycling that we produce um, and often to countries that can't, you know, don't have the capacity to really deal with that. And I think Turkey is a great example. Many of you might have seen in the papers recently. Um, so you can see this chart that, you know, earlier this year, most of our recycling went to Turkey. They've now actually very recently banned most plastic imports. Um, so it's gone the same way as kind of Malaysia or China before that. But essentially other countries are saying, you know, we don't want your plastic waste um, because, you know, they, they don't have the capacity to deal with it properly. And I think, um, yeah, I'm sure that Swanika will have a lot of interesting uh, kind of insight on this when we get to her section. And really the grocery retail sector is kind of, obviously there's this huge dependency on plastic today um, that, you know, we're kind of trying to tackle as a systemic issue. And in this Greenpeace uh, report of Turkey, you can see, you know, so many of these products are food and drink and kind of household products. Um, so, you know, it's a huge part of the, of the overall uh, kind of problem. And public pressure is, is rising. So this is uh, Plastic Free July uh, that we're holding this event. Um, there's a huge kind of choose to refuse single use plastic uh, campaign as part of that. Um, obviously, there's a plastic packaging tax coming in next year on any plastic packaging with um, less than 30% recycled plastic. So that's a drive to try and kind of get more recycled plastic, um, you know, kind of reused. Um, 
And as Paul mentioned, you know, Blue Planet 2, I think, was a, a huge kind of wake up moment a few years ago. But this this pressure is only increasing from consumers. And I'm sure many of you are experiencing that with the kinds of queries that you're getting from your customers um, on this issue. So what can we do about it? Well, if your bath was overflowing, what would you do? Probably the first thing you would do, I would imagine, is turn off the tap. And I think uh, often, too often, we think of, uh, you know, well, we'll just, you know, recycle more effectively. And actually, as we've seen, you know, it's not a silver bullet solution that, that sometimes we think it is. So we need uh, upstream and downstream solutions. So downstream solutions are still really important. And uh, downstream innovation is essentially looking at, you know, all the things that happen after plastics first use. So collection, sorting, recycling, these things are important. They do have a role, but often um, it's, it's a smaller role than sometimes I think we've thought in the past. Um, so, you know, only 9% of plastics recycled, 2% effectively, as I mentioned. So increasing that is a massive global logistical challenge. And I think you know, Repurpose are doing some really um, kind of important work in that area. Um, as one of what we'll talk about later. And then on the removal side, you know, there's potential for innovation there. So they're looking at things like fungus that use plastic. But again, that's still kind of pretty early days. Um, so fundamentally, kind of recycling isn't enough. We need to make less plastic and we need to try and avoid plastic packaging where we can. So this is a recent article in The Grocer. Um, basically, the analogy used was that recycling is, is kind of like a, a magic carpet. that We've swept this waste problem under. Um, when actually you put it back, all of the rubbish we've ever produced is still there. Um, and so really, we need to kind of confront the, the elephant in the room, which is producing less plastic. And that seems to be where the, the kind of debate is now uh, heading. And to produce less plastic, upstream innovation is kind of where we need to place a lot of the focus. So upstream innovation um, is about kind of rethinking products and services at the design stage. So developing new materials, product designs, and models with the aim of reduction. Um, so, you know, thinking of models like the soda stream model um, or, you know, using substitute materials. So uh, really interesting uh, example that Andrew will talk about later with his product where he's done that. Um, and this kind of mindset is so important to, uh, to kind of, yeah, basically think about the problem in kind of broader terms. Um, so, some examples of kind of how you can adopt this this kind of um, upstream innovation mindset and um, by the way sorry I should mention this is also all from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation so we've got some resources that um that Paul will share in the chat in, in a moment so the first strategy uh, for upstream innovation is focused around elimination so this is um eliminating either packaging that doesn't serve an essential function so the example here is uh, Tesco got rid of their uh, kind of multi-pack films. Uh, so when you scan kind of multiple products, you still get the discount, but they found that the multi-pack film actually didn't serve any function. So they were e able to easily eliminate that. And that's an example of kind of direct elimination. Innovative elimination is uh, kind of finding an alternative for something that does serve a purpose. So uh, the example here is uh, Carlsberg actually uh, innovated something called snap pack, which is essentially tiny kind of dots of glue that could be used to hold the cans together, but eliminated the need for plastic rings and film packaging. And crucially, those dots also kind of um, fit within the recycling system. Uh, so, sorry, skip one slide. Um, so reuse is the second strategy. Um, packaging that can be, you know, reused rather than discarded after one use. Um, so obviously, you know, we're familiar with some of the solutions here, but I'll kind of talk through, um, talk through them. So in terms of refill at home, this is a, an image of um, BioD's kind of bulk offering. So they offer 20 litre um, kind of capacity items. So this is a laundry liquid uh, that you can, you know, buy in bulk and refill at home. Then on return from home, this is Abel and, Cole, Abel and Cole's Club Zero, which essentially offers these um, tubs that you can kind of decant at home and then return uh, the, the jars to them once you're done with that. On the refill on the go side, you know, we obviously have a partnership with Unpackaged um, where we're providing a kind of unpackaged solution for, for retailers um, that some of you will probably be aware of. Um, so that's kind of a great example of that solution. And then in terms of return on the go, Scotland are introducing a new kind of deposit return scheme. 
So for certain, you know, including I think most plastic bottles, um, retailers will kind of be obligated to accept kind of empties of those items um, and then they'll be kind of, um, yeah, centrally kind of recycled. So some, some examples of kind of different reuse models there, but I think obviously we're all kind of familiar with, you know, keep cups or, um, you know, soda streams or even, you know, plastic bag fees are all kind of examples of, of these types of models in practice. And then lastly, material circulation. So designing packaging so that materials um, can be kind of either recycled or composted. Um, so, so I think, yeah, Andrew's going to talk about um, a kind of really innovative solution that he's come up with um, for his products, which is really exciting. Um, so I'm not going to steal his thunder on that, but I think it's a great example um, of kind of, uh, yeah, bioplastics in action. And then on substitutions, uh, as an example of that, Seedlip have recently started using this mycelium-based, um, kind of mushroom-based um, packaging. So there's loads of scope for, for innovation here, but essentially, uh, you know, it's about trying to make sure that these materials kind of stay, stay in circulation. And obviously a real benefit of kind of going down the, the bioplastic route is that, um, you know, these materials are generally abundant in nature and uh, and can be very easily reassimilated um, in, in, into that cycle. So the vision that the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation have, um, they have a group called the New Plastics Economy, is to eliminate plastics we don't need, to innovate, to ensure the plastics we do need are recyclable, reusable, compostable, and to circulate all the plastic that we use to keep it in the economy and out of the environment. And I think that's kind of really where we're, you know, what we're aiming for uh, with this discussion. Um, so what are the key actions that businesses can take? Um, really, firstly, to understand your impacts by measuring your plastic footprint. And that's something that we've undertaken that we'll kind of come back to. Sorry. Secondly, is to take responsibility for that by you know, removing an equivalent amount of plastic. And that's something um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about more in the next section. Third, to commit to reducing your footprint through ambitious kind of annual targets. Um, and this is really, I think, where the, the, the harder work begins. And to do that, to achieve those goals, is to rethink your packaging products and business and to try and kind of design out kind of plastic waste. So models like Unpackaged, um, you know, new packaging solutions. And I think one thing, um, you know, that we're struck by is that many, many of you are probably trying to tackle this problem um, you know, the same problems. So there are opportunities for collaboration there. But at this stage, I'm going to hand over to Paul uh, to talk about our commitment. Mute myself. That's always helpful, isn't it? Um, what are we going to do about it at Cotswold Fair? Um, well, just as we went carbon neutral in 2019 um, that doesn't mean that we're you know we're just happily emitting carbon and uh, and just offsetting it all that is what we're doing at the moment but part of that journey is to get to zero carbon it's the same with plastic so at the moment the technology isn't there for some products to be completely plastic free particularly chilled um, I think it is largely there for, for ambient suppliers so we're, we're committed as a company to eliminating plastic from our supply chain. But until we do that, we are now going to be offsetting uh, plastic. And as from today, um, we are plastic neutral. Um, our estimates for this year that is that within our supply chain, now obviously we don't make anything ourselves. So this is all your products, by the way. Uh, the 77, well, not quite all, but pallet wrap is, is the main plastic we're responsible for. But the rest of that 77 tonnes is on your products. And the reason that Svanik is here today is that she is her company, Repurpose, or not company, it's a social purpose uh, organisation, is going to be offsetting our plastic. And I'll let her explain how, how we're doing that. So as a company, we're declaring plastic neutrality. This is something that we are asking our suppliers to do as well. And today is the start of that. 
some companies have done it already a few for, I think um, they're on the call actually Farrington's mellow yellow uh, they are also plastic neutral and um, hopefully a growing number of of our suppliers will will take this journey with us we certainly don't plan to be spending that every year which is the current cost uh, we spent the a quarter of that in our first quarter um, we will be expecting suppliers to be plastic neutral and we will uh, be expecting suppliers to reduce the plastic so that bill is less but that is the current cost um, but we're not we're not going to be carrying on doing that for the next x years because we want you to move forward as i said this is only a halfway house the the, the full um result of this is that there is no plastic there's enough plastic in the world already we don't need any more um so elimination is the way forward so as Ben's put on the slide if you want to go further we're planning to do some little uh, mini groups every month to help each other you know the the whole way forward on this is collaboration I think that's becoming increasingly obvious particularly during the pandemic collaboration is happening more and more and more and if we're going to get to the place we need to get we need to help each other it's not seeing each other as competitors it's seeing each other as collaborators moving forward on the same journey so if you're interested in being part of that group just pop a note in the chat um, and say count me in and ben will collate those and be in touch over the next uh, few days so i think that's the last slide on mine it's over to svanica next and as she's getting on perfect timing ben look at that 25 past well done um, as she's getting ready, I just did put a note in the chat and thanks for all those count me ins. They've gone off my screen, there's so many. Great. Um, I popped a note in the, the chat to say if you've got any questions that come up as, as we're talking, there will be 10 minutes Q and A's at the end. Um, you can either speak the questions out or if you're a bit shy, feel free to pop them in the chat, uh, which might be a better solution to help us get through them quicker. So put any questions later on in the chat and uh, Svanika, do you want to start sharing your slides and over to you. Thanks so much for coming today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, it is a genuine pleasure to be here. Um, hello to everybody. Um, again, thank you so much um, for coming. I think this is such an important topic and it is so heartwarming to see um, so much interest and so much enthusiasm and passion around it. Um, so big, big kind of like shout out and thank you to, to Paul and Ben and everybody at Cotswell for kind of taking this really important step and kind of like convening this platform for us to kind of like come up, come to together and talk about these topics because oftentimes really the, the very first thing that you need is to even just have this conversation right um, as a starting point so really appreciate that um, also kind of I think uh, Gina and, and the Farrington team were there um, we've been working with them for a while now we'll talk a little bit about them in the presentation as well um, but good to see kind of uh, familiar faces um, so with that I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, share my screen um, is everybody able to see what I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, so what I'll basically do um, is give you a little bit of a sense um, of who we are, uh, you know, what is repurpose, what we do, what is the plastic neutral certification, um, and how you can be involved in it, um, as well as kind of, uh, you know, a little bit more about what the impact looks like on the ground. Um, happy to kind of uh, answer any questions on the chat um, after as well, and um, or you can also email me later um, if you have any any questions. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Um, I promise I won't kind of uh, take too much of your time. So it'll be a quick overview um, and we can go into details later. Uh, so Repurpose is the world's first plastic credit platform. So that's a short version of it. Um, the longer version is really, we like to think of ourselves as this kind of enabling entity, this ecosystem, this platform that brings together conscious consumers and organizations and businesses around the world together in this kind of collective fight 
against our plastic crisis. And I don't have to go into too much detail about why that's important. I think um, Paul and Ben gave kind of a, a very extensive, very kind of comprehensive look at, at you know, how the plastic crisis has been just kind of exponentially um, increasing over the last few years. Um, I just have kind of an interesting stat here. I don't know if it's fun. It's kind of a little bit of a sad stat. Um, but in this one hour that we're all kind of spending together with each other, over 30 million kilograms of plastic waste would have been created. Um, and, and so back when I was in college, um, you know, this was before I started Repurpose um, and then, you know, everything kind of uh, came together. This number was very staggering to me. Um, and I had grown up, you know, alongside beaches. I had grown up with this profound love for our oceans and everything that was magnificent about it. Um, and it was really kind of like thinking about, well, what do we do? And, and so I, I did my thesis on this where I spent an entire year um, quite literally going from landfill to landfill to dumping ground to, to kind of informal waste management entity from South America to Africa to Asia, really trying to kind of get to the bottom of, of this problem that, that you're seeing here. And one of the consequent things that I stumbled across, you know, on that journey was also the social problem. And Ben touched on this a little bit um, when he was talking about it, where today about 2% of the world's poorest people work in waste management. And this is because, you know, in North America, whether that's Canada or, or the US, in the UK, so much of our plastic waste is actually not even dealt with within our own borders. And we end up shipping it halfway across the world to places like Turkey, Malaysia, Vietnam, kind of like all of these different countries that unfortunately don't have the necessary infrastructure to deal with their own domestic waste, let alone be the dumping grounds of kind of everybody else in the world. And so there's, there's kind of so much, I think, broken um, in terms of waste management over here that is allowing so much of our plastic to then leak out into the environment. Because if you see these stats about how there are 1,000 major rivers in kind of like some key countries um, that do end up contributing to 80, 90% of marine plastic leakage, um, that's not just because it's only those countries that are producing that plastic, but because we are sending all of ours um, out there and we're not kind of like dealing with it in a name. Uh, viable way. And a lot of these waste worker colonies, um, you know, in today, in this day and age, um, they have life expectancies of just about 35 years or 40 years because of the brutal conditions that they're working in. And again, that is kind of because we are failing in our duty um, to really take, take kind of responsibility for our plastic waste. So you have this environmental problem, you have this kind of social problem. And at the end of it, we were kind of like thinking, well, what is the one thing tying it together? Is it that there's just no ideas out there? Are there just no solutions out there? Um, and we realized that there were. There were hundreds of thousands of amazing innovators and change makers on the ground. But the one key problem was that the, there was no access to capital, sustainable long-term capital that allowed these solutions on the ground to really scale up in any sort of meaningful way. And, and so we said, well, if you have a funding problem, why not go ahead and create a financing solution? And we looked to carbon and said carbon credits in their own right have been quite revolutionary in unlocking private sector capital for solutions that could combat climate change. So can we learn from its weaknesses and and because admittedly it did have some and can we learn from its strengths and then apply that to the plastic space and that's exactly what we did where one plastic credit today is the equivalent of one additional kilogram of nature bound plastic waste that's eliminated. So it's structured as a pioneering financing instrument but it also becomes a really kind of unifying platform that today brings together many different types of plastic waste action that, you know, everything from like, think about what we do today, um, quite literally pulling plastic out of rivers and oceans off the coast of Bali, Indonesia, um, to building new waste management supply chains that can stop the leakage of plastic in the first place, um, say in Southern India, all the way to kind of thinking about scaling up early stage alternatives um, to virgin plastic and kind of refill circular methods and then kind of redesign um, packaging and so on, say in Colombia, and how can all of this be kind of like brought under this one platform of plastic credits. And this came at a really interesting time because we were also seeing this, I think, um, exponential increase in awareness um, and kind of, um, I think, interest from consumers to, to buy sustainable products. And I remember reading somewhere that even when Brexit was happening, people rated plastic waste as a bigger concern to them in the 
UK than Brexit, you know, even kind of like um, from a political landscape uh, standpoint, which I think sends this signal to all of the, the brands out there, all of you guys to really do something about the plastic in, in your packaging. Um, but as we've been talking about today, there is no one silver bullet solution, right? It's not as easy as kind of just Different kind of concerns over here as well and so what we're really saying is you know while we're working towards um, this this holistic solution the plastic neutral certification can give you an affordable accessible way to create immediate impact today in a very holistic um, manner so I'll tell you what that kind of uh, looks like with a, with a quick example um, my vegan was one of the very first brands that we started working with also based um, in the UK um, and then so the first thing that we do is really measure your plastic footprint. Um, so Ben uh, has been working with us to do this for, for a while now, kind of looking at all of your different plastic footprints over here. Um, but if we were to look at it as an individual CPG product, um, it would just be saying, okay, here are the different SKUs, you know, SKUs that I have, and here's the amount of plastic in it. So let's say, you know, for ease of math, um, that you are kind of putting out 10,000 kilograms of plastic, um, you know, with your packaging every year. The second thing is then kind of thinking about well what do we do to reduce it what are we doing to kind of like set reduction targets over here as kind of like ben has been talking about and maybe we're thinking about pcr targets post consumer recycle targets we're thinking about redesign we're thinking about elimination and then in the meantime right so oftentimes what this ends up being is a five-year plan or a three-year plan or a 10-year plan but in the meantime there's still plastic today that is out there in our environment and so what the way we can kind of take responsibility for that um is basically at about kind of you know two sense the product, you would be kind of contributing, um, you know, $5,000 to the platform. And we're able to use this funding to go out on the ground and build impact interventions, build these plastic credit generating projects on behalf of you, such that we remove 10,000 additional kgs of nature bound plastic waste on your behalf. And our guarantee is that every single piece of plastic um, that we are removing for you is a piece of plastic that otherwise would have sat in that landfill, sat in that river, sat in that kind of dumping ground for decades to come, had it not been for your specific intervention. And this is a great way to think about it, right? So I won't go too much into this slide because I think um, Ben already covered a lot of it, but really thinking about, you know, we need to catalyze action across the value chain. So we need to be thinking about replacement, reduction, and redesign on the manufacturing side. We need to be thinking about consumer education, and we need to be thinking about waste management. So how do we all kind of um, bring it together? over here. So under the plastic credit platform right now, we're working with brands um, around the world from Japan to South Korea to Argentina. Um, of course, in the UK and North America are kind of like the big ones. And as you can see, it's really not any one particular sector because plastic is such a ubiquitous material. So even if you're a technology company, whoever you are, there is plastic that you're putting out into the world that needs to be kind of taken um, action on uh, in, a, in a kind of like immediate way. Um, so as we go kind of like just a few quick um, thoughts on this. Um, I think oftentimes we do tend to think about this. One of the reasons, you know, that perhaps there is a little bit of inertia to take action on our plastic waste um, might just be because we're looking at it as a cost item. But what we've also found is that the plastic neutral certification and reduction and redesign schemes and elimination schemes actually go a long way in helping strengthen brand identity and even kind of like, you know, thinking about new cost uh, customer acquisition and thinking about customer retention and thinking about employee satisfaction really all across the board to kind of like position yourself as a conscious um, company and so really thinking about it not just as a cost item but rather as a something that has real ROI um, as we kind of like start working with a new generation of customers out there who really genuinely care about all of these things. Um, so this is a quick uh, spotlight um, of Farrington that we have here. Um, congratulations to Farrington as well. I know recently they won the Queen's Award um, for sustainability for enterprise and, and they've done some excellent things across the board. Um, they, they went carbon neutral, they went plastic neutral, they've, they've done a variety of other things. And you can see how we're able to kind of like take that impact story that they have on the ground and communicate it in a very powerful way across many different channels. So whether that's talking about packaging, 
thing, whether that's talking about kind of like website integrations or even kind of like um, they did this really cool uh, kind of campaign for World Oceans Day where they partnered with other plastic neutral companies in the UK, like small giants and canola, and then did some kind of like giveaways and then social media campaigns to kind of attract uh, customers and so on. Um, so lots of exciting things that we will be able to help you with as well, because we do have kind of, you know, a lot of uh, storytelling resources for you to take that impact story to use in a, in a really cool way. Um, so we'll come back to this. We have some technology tools um, as well uh, to really, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, make sure you are having a conversation um, with your consumers instead of just talking at them, right? Like when you're when you're going on this plastic production journey, um, you want to make sure that you're educating consumers in the, at the same time as well and making sure that you're understanding what you are doing over here. Um, and then so we can come back. We have some browser extensions, some white labeled individual footprint calculators, things like that for your point of sale um, and so on. But I'll end with kind of like just a quick example of, of like what this can look like on the ground. Um, so here I'm using an example of Grove Collaborative. Um, so they are a retailer similar to Cotswold um, in the US. And, and so they're a retailer um, that does kind of like clean beauty, organic home goods, personal care and so on. And it's kind of a, a big company. So we're doing many different types of projects for them across the world. But this is a snapshot of one of them, um, which is in Southern India. So we took this kind of group of villages in Kerala. So for those of you who've been to India, it's kind of Kerala is a coastal state, very beautiful, very poor waste management. Um, and so we took this group of villages that were all coastal in nature, and we did a baseline assessment. And we realized that all of them were kind of like just dumping their plastic waste outside because it had nowhere else to go because there was no municipal waste collection, or they would just set it on fire, um, which is not optimal either. And so we were able to go in here and then create kind of an entire end-to-end -end, um, waste collection and waste management plan for them. Everything from kind of bringing door-to-door -door waste management, door-to-door -door waste collection to 40,000 households, to setting up intermediary you know, material collection facilities to stop plastic from ever reaching the environment in the first place, all the way to kind of guaranteeing that everything that could be recycled 100% does get recycled and none of it ever makes its way to a landfill or a dumping ground or of course our oceans or anything like that and in doing so what we're doing right now is diverting um, almost 1 million pounds of ocean bound plastic waste away every single year on behalf of Grove. I think the 1 million pounds is about 500,000 kgs, um, I want to say, um, in metric. Um, and then that also has, you know, that, that's 1 million kind of pounds that is not out there in the ocean today because of what Grove is doing. And it also ended up creating about 100 new jobs. So there were 84 women and 10 men, 94 new jobs that were created for people who were before in the informal sector, who are now brought into the fold and are given kind of everything that comes with that, with health insurance and in social security, education for their children, all of the good things that come from being a formal participant um, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the space. Um, so yeah, I, I will stop over here because I know uh, that's that's time, um, but happy to answer any other questions um, that you might have uh, as well after. Thanks, Svanika. <laughs> you can tell uh, there's a lot of material there and obviously a lot more to dig into later. I was going to tell you speeding up as you, as you went through. So do get your, your questions ready for the, the Q&As, which should be in about 10 minutes. So now I'm going to hand over to Andrew, whose company is called T-Rex and um, apparently this is the world's first raw fruit and root tea made only with fresh ingredients so you can tell us a bit more about that and then what he's done about reducing and eliminating the plastic in his products. Over to you Andrew. Thanks very much Paul and I'll just get my, um, my screen up for sharing. Can we see that? Is that okay? Have we got that? Welcome just put to it in, yeah, we got it, but just put it in presentation mode. Here we go. Next to the oh, volume at the bottom. That's it. Got it. Yeah. All good? Yeah. Well, thanks very much for your time today. Um, and yeah, we're very much on this journey. We're in this journey. Um, and I, I don't think it's going to be 5, 10, 20 years. I think it's going to be a constant journey. Um, I would like to just note very quick thanks to Ben, who's kind of pulled this together and has chibbied me along to make sure we've got to, got to today. We are um, 
incredibly busy as a business. And, and this is one of the reasons why, because we've changed the product quite drastically. Um, just to recap what we are, we're a fruit tea. Um, very, very simply, our vision is that fruit teas never really taste as good as they smell. Um, and the way we've resolved that, or we had resolved that, was to create uh, effectively fruit pastes and sachets, um, which, um, which effectively gives you a fresh fruit tea. Um, we presented this to Cotswold Fair um, two or three years ago now um, and have gained their support or fantastic support. Um, but one of the main bits of feedback, well, two bits of feedback, and particularly from Paul, was tastes great, um, absolutely brands on point. However, you have got to do something about your packaging. Um, and this is something we didn't take to heart, but we knew we had to action and, and Paul's been one of the main drivers on this. Now, when we started, we started before Blue Planet existed and there's no excuse there, but when you're starting a business, you've got lots of variables, whether it be branding, packaging, product, taste, flavor, and et cetera, et cetera. And when we, we started, we did look at where we got to as a solution today, but at the time that solution actually would have incurred more plastic waste um, and it wasn't anywhere near as recyclable. But one of the key notes, and I guess one of the key actions from what I'm about to say is, things are changing and things are changing really quickly. So just being on the radar, just being part of calls like this are, are absolutely key. So where have we bottomed out? So T-Rex is now, um, it's still the same product virtually, uh, but we are now in a tube, um, not in a sachet. So we don't have any single use plastic. So that's a big tick. Number two, the tube is made out of sugar cane um, or the waste product of sugar cane. So when you, when you, create, su when you create sugar, uh, ethanol is reduced, we then capture the ethanol, the ethanol is then turned into a plastic uh, and it's called a, a low density polyethylene which is fully recyclable. Now this still isn't good enough and we fully accept that but it's still taking one resource and we're not using uh, a natural resource and we're not using fossil fuels. Um, we've also taken away, our, we had a very kind of fancy little filter which allowed people to make one sachet at a time which was once again not recyclable. Um, and we've changed that. And that is now, you can see it in the picture, is a metal recyclable. It's very, just like you would a stainless steel um, infuser. Um, and this has been an incredibly big hit for us. Just it's on, as all the previous speakers have said, it's on everyone's radar. So we are, we have a reusable aspect to our product. We have a fully recyclable as aspect to our product. Um, and I think one of the ways we got to this, which is one of the key questions Ben wanted me to ask today is, we have been watching the market and watching who else has been doing this. And Brew, uh, Bulldog have been leading the way for quite a few years. You can also send their packaging back to them as well now. And they use a very, very similar product to ours. And ours has been now certified in the UK for food. It's actually a Dutch company uh, which produced it, a company called Multitubes. And it's effectively this tube, which is the raw product is, um, is sugarcane. Now we have looked at glass as well. Um, and I know glass has, from the outset, uh, the outside has a much more sort of ecological standing. Unfortunately, when we did the numbers on it for our particular product, being a wet product, although it is ambient, um, it, the yield rate, the breakage, then the recyclability of actually getting the glass black into the system wasn't actually going to be as environmentally friendly for us, as well as our producers couldn't use it. So we had two compromises there. So this is our, you know, our first step towards it. Um, this is, a, a once again, a quick overview. We do have a cardboard outer on at the moment, and this is a another action point, I guess, for a business, when you're a small business, trying to um, innovate and also trying to do what the big boys are doing. So um, trying to, having the resources to innovate, especially in packaging due to minimum runs and production and so on and so forth. What we eventually did was we produced the tube as a one, one design, um, just our first 25,000 tubes. And then we've used cardboard outers, which are also recyclable to show the variance. And I think this is a really good takeaway. What we found is, when you're first lumped with, if you've got five blends, and was as we do, and that'd be a 20, 125,000 minimum run, it was gonna be such a big capital investment, not knowing if we would be successful with this product. Being able to stagger things um, when you're doing it from a cash flow perspective is obviously you know, really, really useful. And this has been a way we've innovated with our manufacturer, um, with our, um, and with our uh, uh, tube producer. Um, it has added cost into the product, but as we've able to scale, we uh, very shortly, we'll be able to show you in a minute where we've got to. Um, this is the full range. Sorry, it's a little bit skewed there, a little bit uh, stretched, but we've got five blends, as I said, with a reusable filter. And then this is where we're ending up with. So we'll be our next range, which comes out in October, um, which will be tubes printed. Um, we're taking away any black element, although our tubes, the black plastic in our tubes are recyclable. Um, we will be able to, there's a perception that some plastics aren't recyclable, which are black, which is totally fair. So we're changing all of that just from a perception perspective. Secondly, we're actually 
the, we've updated these. We're actually going to move to a screw tap, screw cap because uh, it's going to take out six percent, uh, sorry, six grams of plastic out of the cap as well. Um, and both parts are both LDPE and they're both going to be recyclable. Um, I'm just cracking back and looking at my list. Um, so for me, the key outtakes are um, it's about um, making it manageable when you're trying to do this. Quite often the numbers and the figures to try and do something is a real challenge. So it's trying to take it in stages. Second thing is um, things are changing. So always keep your eyes on the market. For us, it was the brew dog moment, uh, brew dog, sorry, bulldog um, packaging, which was a real penny drop moment. And then we talked to them, they um, re recommended a manufacturer. And invariably, because it's such a positive conversation, that if you're trying to change something for the good, nearly any business will talk to you. And I would, you know, obviously places like Cotswold Fair are exactly that and why we're having this meeting today. Um, and the other thing is to copy people. So much like that is just to lean in um, a lean in and use that. So we, we haven't got to a point where we're looking at our numbers from a, can we be plastic neutral, carbon neutral, but that is now our next stage to get to that and, and to get some numbers and to build that around us. And that will be key to our next investment plan. I think I'll probably leave it there because there's probably more questions than anyone else, but from anyone else. So um, I hope that helps. Great, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. And um, thanks to all the, the speakers today. Um, so time for questions. Uh, do I, you more than welcome to unmute yourself or just pop it into the the chat? Uh, we've only got one there at the moment, which I'll I'll come on to in a minute. Um, but yeah, we obviously we've got ten minutes now to to ask questions and don't you know? Th there's a lot of mystery around these these areas. Don't don't hold back, and no one's going to think you're asking a stupid question because uh, not many of us know enough about this area. So uh, to do uh, get the questions flowing. So the first one is from Bert at Fruits of the Forage. Has anyone had any thoughts on shrink wrap for cases? either compostable alternatives, or can it be collected from customers and bailed for recycling? Who would like to take that question? Don't rush at once. <laughs> ben, do you wanna start uh, yeah, that I, off? I yeah, I can comment, yeah. So this is definitely something that um, across Welfare we're looking into in the context of pallet wrap, um, but I think it's, you know, the similar innovations. So we've been looking at um, uh, basically compostable biodegradable pallet wrap options and it's something we haven't kind of got to a, uh, kind of making a final decision yet but um, they're yeah we're very happy to kind of share the outcome of our uh, research as it kind of uh, as we basically decide which supplier we're going to end up using um, but we're in conversations with a few different companies including uh, Swiftpack who um, have solutions on the market uh, for this and I think, um, yeah, definitely, definitely one that we're really happy to kind of keep the conversation going on. But it's something we're hoping to make a decision on really in the next couple of months. Um, and yeah, definitely pallet wrap is a, a big one. You know, it's the only, it's the only kind of plastic that we are directly responsible for. So we're really keen to make sure we're using, um, you know, the, the least impactful option that we, uh, that we can. Yeah, so we, we did trial some um, before you were here, Ben, actually, and uh, it, it just wasn't good enough and pallets were, were falling over, which is also not very sustainable because it created a load of waste. Um, so it's something that I hope the technology moves forward faster than it is at the moment. We, we get through about, I think it's about seven tonnes a year, isn't it, Ben, on, on pallet rack. When considering the little that goes onto each pallet is... Quite remarkable. Um, Sarah uh, from Rod and Benz has said, would be interested in any thoughts on replacing our plastic pots? So Rod and Benz is organic soup for those who don't know, uh, but it needs to have hot fill capacity. And so far we haven't found anything suitable. I don't know if there is anything suitable for that. Does anyone, I mean, if it, if it, don't just leave it to the uh, panelists here. If anyone's got any wisdom on that, Andrew. I'm fortunately, our products hot fill as well. And I'm unfortunately we struggle with this and we've asked this question. So it's not unfortunately to compound the issue is we, we've spent a lot of time looking at different options for this and the hot fill element makes it, um, it especially if it's a wet product, uh, makes it a lot more, a lot more difficult. Obviously if it is uh, the only other potential option is to look at pouches. So 
um, looking at, there are new ones coming out at the moment, so more like um, sort of baby food pouches. But once again, there's many unsustainable one, versions of those, but they're quite an interesting one. But I know they have a, a lot more problems on shelf and also in um, transit just because of the shape and they, they're quite fluid and they move around. So there's a few negatives there. The only solution we looked at and we didn't work for us was a pouch. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Emily at Wessex Mill is also, they're now their, their flower uh, used to come in a long time ago, Emily used to come in cardboard boxes, I remember that, but it's now each five bags of flour are shrink wrapped into plastic. Um, and she's asking whether there's anything suitable for doing that. So that probably is one of the biggest sources of plastic in our supply chain is, is people who have removed cardboard probably years ago to reduce the cost of that and either have a completely plastic wrapped outer like Emily or have a cardboard tray with, with uh, plastic over the top to hold the products in. So has anyone got any, uh, are there any plant-based alternatives for that kind of plastic that's strong enough to hold a case together? Anyone know? Is it, I told you this would be more questions than, than answers, but you know, that's why we're, creating this uh, group to start looking for more answers. We didn't say we were going to have all the answers today. I don't think, Ben, on the pre-publicity, did we? <laughs> no, I <laughs> we certainly them. haven't. Yeah, Paul? A few answers for you. Okay. I'll put them on the chat, but there are 60% recycled pallet wrap materials available in the market. We use them at Tim's Dairies now on all of our pallets outbound, so you can get recycled content up and still have structurally sound pallets. Our pallets are 500 kilos, so they work. They're not problematic. They're available from companies like Eurofilms, Swiftpack, etc. That was one. There are hot fill paper cups available. So if you look at porridge brands, there's one or two that now have 100% paper packaging that are capable of having boiling water put in them to make the porridge into porridge from dry oats. So there must be solutions for hot fill in plant-based. Um, what was the other one? Consolidation. We've taken all shrink wrap off of all products in a case level across the business. So we changed our collation tray design to be slightly deeper fit, reduced the plastic contact in the trays and got rid of the shrink wrap in the same instance. So there are ways around all of these issues. You've just got to find brands that have already done it and have a look yeah. at them and ring them up and talk. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Would you be able to share some of that info and um, Ben can then send it out after this webinar? Yeah, if, if Ben reaches out to me, we can talk it through. Yeah, yeah excellent. Thanks, thanks so much for that. I have uh, a, um, um, sorry, okay. Paul, I was just going to, I was going to say, I have kind of a, not, not an exact answer to kind of like the, the exact questions um, that are in the chat at the moment, but just kind of like more a system systems answer, um, which is basically, I think, um, one thing that we would encourage, like that we do encourage that, that that's a starting point for the plastic certification as well. But in general, when we're thinking about these things is to start with a fairly extensive plastic footprint um, activity, because I think like once you really kind of like study and map out the different areas where you're using plastic in, um, I think a lot of insights come in from there, where oftentimes we see something and we think, oh, this is the, this is the most amount of plastic that I'm using, but you do the footprint activity and you realize actually there's all of this other plastic that is you know I can almost get rid of immediately that I, I'm not sure why I'm using at the moment um, and, and so I think that that using that as kind of like a springboard allows you to be a lot more comprehensive in kind of like you know the next steps that you're going after as well um, and then once you kind of know exactly where the plastic and what kind of plastic um, is coming from I think then exactly as Paul was saying um, there is a lot to be done, said in kind of like looking to similar brands around the world that have done kind of like you know tackle those exactly exact problems um, and then learning from that. Um, the other thing that I would also say is maybe just being um, quite holistic in terms of how we're thinking of end of life management um, for some of these things. Like we have had brands that um, sometimes are kind of like, you know, just really, really eager about this thing. Um, and then they say, okay, we're going to switch.
switch to kind of like say compostable plastic. Um, but the kind of compostable plastic that they switch to is a kind that only composts over 10 years. And so if it's out there in the environment for 10 years, the, the kind of effect on the environment is pretty much the exact same as if it was just any other virgin plastic out there in the environment as well. Um, and, and so just kind of doing a lot more research into the exact nature of the end of life, um, I think is also just, you know, just good practice um, after the after the footprint uh, assessment that you do. Um, and just to make sure that, you know, like I think there's a lot of solutions out there. Um, how do you kind of like, you know, filter out some that are kind of more greenwashy than others um, and really kind of focus on the ones that are holistically um, good. Yeah. Thanks, Monica, that's helpful. And a question to me here, um, how much shelf life reduction would Cotswold Fair be proud to accept to support a move to recyclable plastic? Um, well, good, this is from Gordon Rhodes. Um, I happen to know their products have a really, really long shelf life. So in your case, um, you, could, you could shave off several months, I would have thought, and it wouldn't make any impact at all. I mean, our, you know, our, average stock in our warehouse is, is four and a half weeks um, and our retailers if they've got stuff on the shelves for for two or three months they're probably not doing terribly well so um, yes in your case but obviously a chilled product for example that had three weeks life on if you take a, a week off that that obviously has a much bigger impact so uh, the answer is yes and probably let's let's talk I think on that one um, Barnes, we're nearly finished. So Barnes has asked, has PLA become a helpful alternative to plastic yet? It's question number one. And question two, where or how can we assess the full life cycle of a packaging method? Can anyone help with those answers? I can I can start okay, uh, sure. perhaps yeah um, I think the the short answer not to plug but we can help I think that's exactly what we do um, we basically help you think through these things once you've done kind of the the footprinting when you're thinking about these different ones our sustainability team can help with that um, outside of that I think I'm happy to share some resources um, you know maybe Ben I can send it to you and we can send it to everybody um, there is actually a lot of really cool kind of tools that have come out. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard of kind of, you know, there's a systemic, uh, put out this thing called Plastic IQ um, that has come some really cool kind of uh, insights into if you just, it's like an online tool called Plastic IQ. I think it also has like an app for it. You put in kind of your different packaging and it tells you where everything is going, what is happening to it. And it has kind of like some insights after that as well. So similar to, to Plastic IQ, there are some tools out there um, that, that I can kind of uh, send after the call to, to people out there as well okay that would be very helpful and we'll follow up this conversation with a with a, um, an email or whatever and and we'll send you the presentation as well so i think we better draw to a close it is just uh, one o'clock thanks very much for coming thank you to ben svanica and andrew for your presentations and the most encouraging thing for me here is the number of people that said, uh, count me in. This is similar to, a, we ran an environmental conference in May 2019. And uh, one thing we did there was to get people to commit to action by both personally and as businesses by writing post-it notes and sticking them on the wall. And we've still got those post-it notes stuck in our meeting room glass of our meeting room um, in Thiel. And I know not all the names are on them, but I know a number of those actions have happened. And some of them were quite big ones um, two years ago, um, uh, which is really encouraging to see every time I go in that room. So let's not just say count me in, let's start doing something about it. And obviously you'll be hearing from us more uh, in the next few days, weeks and months as we all fight together to rid the world of plastic. Thanks for coming. Enjoy your lunch and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ben, for putting this together. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, guys. All the best. Best of luck.